plan was pretty simple. Hit them on the right, hit them on the left, while they're engaged on both sides and they've drawn from their center, kick them in the middle, break the army in half, destroy each half in order, and then win the presidential election of 1864, become the President of the United States, the hero of the Union. You all remember the $4 bill has a picture of President McClellan on it. Um, obviously something didn't happen right, and there were two things. First of all, on the north side, when he attacked with the 1st and 12th Corps, at the time, the last indication that he got back before he sent the 2nd Corps in is things are going well. Well, the next thing he hears, a long time later, is your 1st Corps commander's been shot down, your 2nd Corps commander's dying, and he had already sent the 2nd Corps in. And so he already wasn't following his plan, but down here on the south side, this was the other glitch. This should have started much earlier in the morning than it did, and in fact, we're going to see assaults down here really from about 9.30 in the morning, which is when the second corps went in to the center, which should have been the third movement, not the second. Um, things were getting started down here, but in fact, we won't have success in this part of the battlefield until 1 p.m. What happened was, you've got Georgians primarily, and at one point in the battle, there were more of them than just the, uh, uh, just the few that would be down here later on. We're, we're talking by, by the middle of the day, <coughs> only about 500 men down here defending this bridge. Kemper and Drayton are backing them up in the town here, but at various points, Robert E. Lee's pulling reinforcements out of this area and taking them north, so the numbers started stronger, they're going to diminish through the day. The second problem we have here is that General Burnside isn't exactly sure completely of his command status, which in the middle of a battle is not a good time to figure out what your scope of authority is. He's still uh, under the delusion, at least at the beginning of the day, that he might still be a wing commander. Now, what that means for him is that if, as a wing commander, which he was at the Battle of South Mountain, um, he would have had greater control over all the assets in his area. If he's just a corps commander, then things like additional artillery support and whatnot would not necessarily be under his command. And in fact, McClellan, being very cautious, is pre pretty much giving a deaf ear to Burnside's uh, call for more artillery in this area. If he had had a, a good artillery support in here, this obviously would have become a pretty untenable position. Um, so we have some, some issues here. The one thing you need to know is that Burnside and McClellan are old buddies. They had known each other before the war. As a matter of fact, when Burnside went broke after inventing a rifle called the Burnside Rifle, which interestingly enough, when the Civil War broke out, the Union Army did buy. Uh, but he couldn't get a buyer for it at the time, and he didn't have the money. Uh, he got a job with the Illinois Central Railroad working for George McClellan. So these guys had been friends before the war. They knew each other from the Army before the war. But here that, that friendship breaks down. Burnside's asking for support. McClellan, being cautious, is not giving it. So Burnside is left to his own devices. And in this particular area, it does not go well for them. The first assault was to go right into the creek and try and come out the other side. Now, Burnside understood he had to have the bridge for artillery, as you can see from the relatively steep short banks, you can't drop artillery down into that creek here. He tries that, the men are shot down, that one fails. He then sends a group up to Snavely Ford, which is a little more, more than half a mile down. They get lost in the woods, <laughs> and they disappear for a couple of hours. That doesn't help. You can see the old farm road running down to the right of the bridge, the next group he sends up the farm road. The problem is, as you can see from this position, the riflemen in the pits below us, this is actually the quarry from which the stone was taken for the bridge, and the men in the wooded area, and there was a wooded area over to this side, the, the columns of four that would have been coming up were laid out just like ducks in a shooting gallery. Basically, all you had to get was elevation right because windage didn't matter. You were going to hit somebody if you fired into their ranks as they were coming along the bend down there. So that became an untenable proposition. Finally, just before 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Burnside takes two regiments with the same numeric number. They're both the 51st. 51st Pennsylvania and the 51st New York. Now the New Yorkers mutinied. Um, they weren't going to make the assault. And the reason for it is their commanding officer, who was a believer that uh, the Army should not have a whiskey ration. And I can tell you in those days, whiskey ration did occasionally get guys in trouble. Um, the men wanted their whiskey ration back and they weren't going to make the assault without it. And so 
the commander was actually forced to relent and make the comment, you know, if I have to buy the whiskey myself, you will have your whiskey ration back. The two regiments went down, one to the stone fence and one to the wooden fence. They assaulted straight down the hill opposite. And by this point in time, first of all, we've been fighting for a while, so there are some casualties up here. Of the 500-odd Confederates, really, we're, we're only going to see um, just a, a, about 120 killed. Of the 5,000 Federals, over 5,000 Federals, we're going to see uh, a little bit more, 500, about 10% on their side. But when you've only got 500 men, 120 <laughs> down is a lot. And what happens is the men on the stone fence begin to really have an effect with getting carefully aimed fire up on this hill. They start to suppress fire from this area. And actually it was the non-commissioned officers of the 51st over there that started pulling their men by, through in squads and eventually by half companies. Once they got across the bridge, they took up off towards the auto farm here and were able to file back up, throwing an enfilading fire up in this direction. And once that happened, there was nothing to hold Burnside back. He was able to take his position. The Confederates had to fall back to um, the area towards the town back behind us. And it will take then until 3 o'clock in the afternoon for Burnside to get all 5,000 out of his men and his artillery across this bridge, get him reorganized on this side, and begin their assault up the Auto Farm Road towards the rear of the town. At one point, we are told that uh, McClellan actually wrote out a set of orders that were delivered shortly after 1 o'clock. The orders were that, I'm assuming you've taken the bridge, immediately start for the town. But there was a second set of orders, and the second set of orders, if he had not gotten across the bridge, was arrest for insubordination. So by this time, whatever friendship they had, it pretty much completely broken down. What's interesting? After this battle, Burnside will blame McClellan. McClellan will blame Burnside. Uh, McClellan's position will not be held by the government, and Burnside will actually take over McClellan's command, despite his performance here. So there, there was enough confusion in the situation as to whose problem it really was that Burnside will assume command, and he will unfortunately find himself in the midst of a debacle a couple months later at Fredericksburg, Virginia, um, where the Irish Brigade who's fighting so bravely and at such incredible loss here at uh, uh, Bloody Lane will again face the same type of, uh, of assault up a hill at uh, Mary's Heights. So quite a, quite a terrible thing. From the medical standpoint here, there's really two problems that we have to overcome. One is you are far away now from McClellan's headquarters. You can't see it in the distance. It's not visible. You're not near a major road. You're near this little farm road, but you're not near the major roads to and from. And because of it, we're going to have to evacuate these men a bit further away than we are in some of the other parts of the battlefield. The other difficulty here is the commanding officer cannot see what's going on down here and is going to have to rely on a fairly long line of communications. For Jonathan Letterman after the battle, the problem is, is you have a number of hospitals of opportunity that are strewn out from here on the south back up towards um, the hospitals that he had set up the, in the days before the battle towards the Locust Spring Hospital near Keatesville. Um, you're going to have a bunch of hospitals of opportunity down here that afterwards he's going to have to find in order to supply and evacuate. You're also going to have several Confederate field uh, hospitals of opportunity back up in this area. Uh, that again will not be on the main Confederate path of evacuation that Letterman's going to have to take over. When we look at the maps, and I'll make sure that we have that map ready uh, for the debriefing, when we have the uh, map of all the hospitals as they existed the day after the battle, you're going to be shocked at just how spread they are. And when you're trying to think through the problems of how do we supply, how do we evacuate, how do we handle this, what you're going to find is that these hospitals of opportunity, especially in the southern portion of the battlefield, um, have a fairly spread out geographic pattern to them and communication with them is going to be hard until they can be consolidated and brought into a, uh, a more condensed geographic region. That help? And one other thing that you cannot forget here, these are Georgians. And what does that mean? Well, first of all, we know that a lot of the Georgians up on this hill were armed with the Model 1841 rifle and you're saying, well, gosh, that's a 20-year-old rifle. It's also a very accurate weapon. And these Georgians, for the, many of them, like the Midwestern boys from places like Indiana, Minnesota, Michigan, uh, parts of Ohio. A lot of the Indiana boys uh, were known for riflemen, were known as riflemen. Well, so were the Georgians and the Mississippians and the Alabamians. 
And when you put a good rifleman in a pit like this where he's got time to aim, you put a good high quality rifle in his hand and the Mississippi rifle was a very accurate weapon. This, this is part of why they were able to hold it for as long as they did against the odds that they did. Any questions here? Does all make sense? Who, who is the president? Is it McKinley? Is there... is... Uh, yeah, the president, there's actually there's a great monument right back on the other side of the parking lot here. It's a gray, uh, a gray column with an eagle on top, and it's actually dedicated to a man who's, uh, whose contribution, and, it, and it, I don't say this lightheartedly, his contribution was he broke down uh, a kitchen and made coffee for his men under fire because they were just out of energy. And you put enough sugar and enough caffeine in a, in a system, as we all know, you know, Mountain Dew, uh, it'll get you going for a while, and that's exactly what he did. He made coffee under fire and was promoted for it. Now, you're probably saying there aren't a whole lot of monuments to guys who made coffee under fire in the Civil War. When you become the President of the United States, like uh, President McKinley, <laughs> you get your own monument on the battlefield. What's interesting is McKinley belongs to the same regiment is another president of the United States. Rutherford B. Hayes was his commanding officer. And Rutherford B. Hayes was actually wounded at the Battle of South Mountain two days before and was being treated in Middletown, Maryland for his wounds. So two presidents out of one regiment, that's uh, pretty rare, pretty rare. But he's got a monument right up on the other side to his making coffee in, in bas relief. There he is, making <laughs> coffee um, in, in, this grand, uh, in this grand monument. Where was Holmes, Oliver Wendell Holmes? I'm sorry, what? Where was Oliver Wendell Holmes? Where was Holmes on the battlefield? Do you remember? I think he was up at the he was up in the cornfield area. Cornfield. Yeah. That's, I couldn't remember if he was first or twelfth. Yeah, he was up at the northern end. He was up there right near my great great grandfather, who you've never heard of and never will because he wasn't anybody important. Well, tell us his name then. We will. Yeah, uh, William Wallace Pedrick. He was one of the marble headers. He was descendant, seriously, he was a descendant of the men who had rode Washington across the Delaware and made the escape from Brooklyn. Um, he was descendant of the watermen who fought in George Washington's army from Marblehead in that area around Boston. And then he, he fought here and then at Gettysburg where he was captured when the 11th Corps collapsed. And uh, he was trapped and wound up, unfortunately, after that getting rheumatic fever. There's a great story of disease, rheumatic fever, went through the prisoner of war encampment near Chambersburg and nailed a bunch of guys and within seven months his heart was in such bad shape they couldn't keep him in active service and he had to be relegated to the Veterans Reserve Corps uh, because the rheumatic fever destroyed his heart and by the time he was 50 years old he was dead. Congestive heart failure. So there's a guy who survived <laughs> two of the worst fights in the world here at the cornfield and then at Gettysburg on the first day and what brought him down was a germ. 10, 15 mm -hmm. years after the war. Any other questions here? Did that help you in it what does. you're doing? Yeah, and the other thing is, uh, when we take them back to the visitor center, are you not talking to them again? Because we typically also <coughs> close the battle here as well, if we don't do it elsewhere. I would go ahead and close the battle here.